On your Tuesday episode of Locked On Raptors, we can't waste time because you all sent in a million good questions about the NBA draft. We have to answer them now. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Tuesday, June the 11th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website, at Woodley Sean. You can find the uh, Instagram channel for the show, Instagram page, whatever it's called, at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us over on Discord. The Locked On Raptors Discord is free to join. The link is in the description of the podcast, and it's a great place to come hang out, talk Raptors, talk draft, talk NBA Finals, and how sad it's making all of us. It's a wonderful place to be among friends. And uh, on draft night, I will be in there doing a little voice hangout, reacting to everything as it goes down. It should be a great time. We would love to see you become part of our listener family and join us for a little draft hangout in just two weeks and one day's time. Of course, you can find the show for free. Don't forget your podcast, follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. Always appreciate it when you support the show. However you support the show on the audio side of things, you can also go to YouTube and subscribe to the Locked On Raptors YouTube channel. Hit the notification bell and you will get a heads up via push notification every single time the show premieres or goes live it's a wonderful thing uh and even if you're not going to watch the videos just subscribe juice the stats it makes me feel good thanks in advance for doing that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel make every moment more right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets that's $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet that's 200 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started and we will get started here digging in or digging out of the pile of mail that's been dumped on me by you the lovely listeners both on the hell website and over at the locked on raptors discord mailbag questions channel uh where i put out the call for draft questions and boy oh boy did you folks deliver and we're going to take the next two days to sort through all of these questions i got many dozens of questions we've pared it down to just two dozen questions that i'm going to take today and tomorrow to rattle through a dozen questions per day. Uh, hopefully we can get to all the, you know, some of the questions kind of have overlap with each other. So I eliminated some from the mix. Apologies to any of you who sent in questions who are not going to get them read on the show, but no, I saw them. No, I appreciate very much you sending them on in. Let's get rolling, shall we? Let's not waste any more time. Question number one for today from ESP325 in the Discord if we were to hit perfectly on our draft pick what archetype of player would have the most impact going forward how much should we focus on completing our core this draft versus next draft it's kind of a two-pronged question i'll take the second part very quickly um i think you kind of just gotta take who you can in this draft and then see what happens next year right see who's projecting um maybe you know to look like an actual core piece going forward right that can change your calculus in the middle of this season it can change your calculus going into next season i also think that like scotty barnes taking a big jump or emmanuel quickly taking a big jump probably informs as well you know, what draft sort of slot they're going to have, what they're looking at in terms of next year's draft. Are they going to try to angle themselves towards the bottom of the standings or let it ride and try to be a competitive, fun team? Um, Lots of variables. So for now, I think you just got to use your picks and take who you can get and hope you project future stardom upon one of these guys or both of these guys that you're going to take at 19 and 31 and go from there and kind of evaluate as you gather more information about this group as to, okay, is the core complete? What's the next move to you know complete the core? Is it via trade? Is it via the draft, et cetera, et cetera? The first part of the question I think is fascinating. If the Raptors were to hit perfectly on a draft pick, what archetype of player would have the most impact going forward? I do think there's kind of two answers here. And look, I've been talking all in the lead up to this draft about how I think uh, wings are an absolute priority for this team. Someone who can push RJ Barrett to the two long term provide some stable point of attack wing defense, someone you can throw on the opposing team's best players to allow Scotty Barnes to be in his best position defensively, which is as a low man on the baseline, roaming around, shot, block, blocking shots, offering help defense, things like that. Um, and, and so I do think like a two-way wing would be absolutely fantastic. Hey, a two-way wing with a little bit of creation juice, even better I think that's probably the answer here, although I do have to also acknowledge that if the Raptors were able to draft a true two-way stretch big, someone who can 
hit threes, step out, sit in lineups with Jakob Pertl and be more of a of a four, perhaps, or obviously be a five next to Scotty Barnes at the four. Like I, I think there's all kinds of possibilities when you have a three point shooting big man. We've seen this with the Raptors back when Serge Ibaka was on the team and Marcus Saul was on the team. Just how valuable it is to have shooting from the five. And if you can hit on, say, a Khalil Ware, for example, and turn him into a legitimate two-way shot-blocking three-point shooting center, that can be an absolute game-changer for you. It, you know, That's the type of player that might have saved the Pascal Siakam OG Ananobi iteration of this team. They didn't find it, and we're sitting here where we are now. Um, that type of player can be an absolute ceiling raiser, game changer, floor shape, altering all of that type of guy. Um, so that's probably, you know, the, the close second answer, but I do think wings, 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 wings are what make the world go around in the modern NBA and perimeter wing defense is such a need for this team. And they have Jakob Pertl. I think Jakob Pertl is a perfectly fine stopgap so that the wing situation is like a little bit more, uh, urgent to go and find a guy there. Question number two. From Stago in the Discord, other than Zach Eady, who is your least favorite player who was in this range at 19? Um, look, I, I feel like I talked about Zach Eady yesterday. I don't like hate Zach Eady as a player. I do think there is like an NBA floor for him, which, you know, when you're picking at this part of the draft is a success story. That's nice. If you can be in the NBA uh, from being a player in the mid to late first round, that is a success story. I just don't know if the fit with the Raptors is right. So that's kind of why I classify him as maybe not one of my favorite guys um, for the Raptors at 19. Other than that, like this is kind of a rich part of the draft in guys who I do quite like. Um, I'm having a hard time sort of picking a guy who I really, really don't like in this range. Um, I think there's arguments to be made for a lot of different dudes and you should feel pretty good that at 19 and 31, the Raptors are going to snag two of those pretty good dudes. I think for me, it's probably just a, a flat out Terrence Shannon Jr. I don't think the Raptors should be in the business of drafting people who are currently in the middle of criminal trials for violent sex crimes. And that's just my opinion on it. We should not be looking at Terrence Shannon. It should be a do not draft situation there. Um, other than that, I could talk myself into a lot of these guys at 19 or 31, um, all varying degrees of interesting. Even Ryan Dunn, who I have a question about, I think on tomorrow's show, He's probably the next guy in this range that who I'm just not super thrilled about. But at 31, the incredible defensive upside he has, maybe, just maybe, it's worth it. And you can feel okay taking Ryan Dunn, even if the offense is never really going to be above average, close to average. You know, that that's it's a, it's a real concern there for him. But the defensive playmaking is also interesting enough that I wouldn't be, like, despondent if the Raptors took him at 31. At 19, I think it'd be a reach, but... Um, 31, I think you could talk yourself into it and we'll get into more Ryan Dunn, I believe on tomorrow's podcast. Number three here, quickly rattling through from Dill in the discord, asking if Ron Holland dropped to 19, would you take him for the Raptors? And look, I was not a huge fan of Ron Holland in the time where we were sort of predicting the Raptors and potentially picking in the top six, whether it was moving up into the top four or keeping their pick at number six before the draft lottery. Ron Holland was not doing it for me. And frankly, none of the guys at the top of this draft were really doing it for me. The idea of using a very high pick, which comes with a higher salary slot, uh, a sort of higher burden of hopefully this guy can be successful. None of the, the top guys in this draft outside of one or two really interested me all that much. And it was a big reason why I was team convey all along. The top of this draft just was not it for me. But if Ron Holland is there at 19, I do think you just got to take them and, and hope that you kind of have the Cam Whitmore thing, even if I'm not as high on Cam Whitmore as a lot of people seem to be, but like projected lottery guy who slides all the way to 19. If you can take Ron Holland there, that's the upside swing, right? That's a, a guy who has the physical dimensions, the body of an NBA player, no doubt can be a transition player for you. Maybe has a high defensive upside for you. Um, I do think the fit with Scotty Barnes long-term is pretty shaky. If the shot doesn't come around and the shot is a massive question with Ron Holland, but at 19, I think it's worth the swing for a guy who had lottery talent at times was projected to be even the number one pick in this draft at 19. I think you just got to do it. Even though like you also have to ask yourself, why is this guy sliding? What do all these other 18 teams know that we don't if he's sliding? And it's possible the Raptors do know what's going on and the reasons why Ron Holland is sliding. It seems kind of a consensus that he's maybe even going to slip out of the top 10, maybe slip out of the lottery. It, it feels crazy for a guy with his athletic tools, but I also get it for a guy who 
can't shoot. We've seen this a lot, right? The big sort of bouncy wing types who, oh, only the shot comes. You know, sometimes those guys turn into really good players. Sometimes those guys are Stanley Johnson. And the downside of drafting a Stanley Johnson with a high pick is is pretty significant. At 19, though, I, I do think whatever the reasons are that Ron Holland slide into 19, you take him. Maybe you get that sort of chip on the shoulder. I can't believe 18 teams just, you know passed on me. I'm going to wear number 18 for the rest of my career type of thing. And maybe that is a boon for you going forward. But um, yeah, I- interesting what's going on with Ron Holland. If he's there at 19, I do think it's kind of a no-brainer. You just got to do it, even if he's not my favorite prospect I've ever examined. We'll come back on the other side. We've got more on high upside guys. We've got more on Bronny James, anybody? Coming up as we continue our run through a dozen questions in 30 minutes or thereabouts uh, coming up uh, in just one second. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, the single best place to play uh, all of your various bets for all of your various sports that you like to consume. Summertime means baseball, the NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals, and more, and you can bet it all on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on everything from the Finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park. Drew Holiday, man, looking pretty good through a couple games. There's all this sort of, who's the the, the best player on the Celtics? Is it Jalen Brown? Is it Jason Tatum? Are they going to split the vote while Drew Holiday goes and actually wins the thing with like three or four votes from the the panel of 10? Very possible. Maybe you want to put some scratch down on Drew Holiday going and winning finals MVP. Maybe you want to do the happiness hedge against the notion of the Celtics winning. Maybe you bet on the Celtics actually winning and closing this thing out over the Mavericks. And that way, if you if they do do that and it's terrible and they've won the championship, at least you get some money out of it. That's a good way to do it too, right? Uh, 200 bucks again, for any winning $5 bet, it's going to be yours in your account and bonus bets. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on uh, and add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, no time to waste. we got more questions to get through here. Let's keep rattling through on your Tuesday mailbag edition of the show. This one comes from Midrange Assassin asking, who in this class has the highest upside available at 19 and 31? Kind of talked about the types of players who would have really immense upside if the Raptors were to hit on them and uh, have them kind of hit their high outcomes and the value of that. And I do think Khalil Ware is very much in that conversation. I know there's maybe some questions about his defensive footwork and speed and stuff, but a guy who can, in theory, shoot threes, barely shot you know more than one and a half a game in college. Again, a lot of it is very speculative with Khalil Ware, but he does feel like the most likely of all of these bigs in this range, Kyla Filipowski, Zach Eady, Khalil Ware, Eve Misi, of all these guys, it feels like Ware is the most likely to kind of become one of those modern sort of game-changing bigs. And so he's probably it for me. I would also throw Bub Carrington in here, uh, just with the pull-up shooting juice he seems to have at six foot five. That is a really valuable package to have. There's no saying if it all comes together, it's very possible he just becomes kind of like a a, a gunner off the bench, frankly, and uh, is not contributing all that much to winning. Or maybe he's sort of one of those sort of regular season guys who can't hang in the playoffs. But uh, if it all comes around and the pull-up shooting is real at that size, Bub Carrington could be something pretty special. Those are probably the two highest upside guys in this range. You know, I guess you could probably throw a vote out um, for Keyshawn George just because he's so young, but maybe the speed and athleticism is not quite there for that. I also think Pacom Dadier out of France, who we're going to talk about later this week, is probably on that list as well as a, as a guy who's kind of rising up boards right now and has tons of upside just as a 6'8 wing who can create his own shot and be 6'8 and do wing things. Next question here, number five, comes from Cody. In a draft this lackluster, why not take a swing on Bronny for the marketing value alone? Bronny James. We love to talk about Bronny James, don't we? This is the only thing we can talk about. Bronny James and the Lakers. It's uh, The finals are going on, and they're the only two things that matter. Um, Cody, appreciate the question. I think the draft is lackluster at the top. I think that's kind of always been the thing. I think there was maybe this idea, and frankly, I was swayed by it a bit early on of, oh, this whole draft stinks. It's bad. Just get out of it. But I do think kind of digging into it more, the range from like 15 to 40, pretty interesting. A lot of players who I think are going to be long-term role players in the NBA, which is great in that range of the draft. It's the top of this draft that really is not super interesting to me as far as like high upside potential stars. And so 
I, I just think the idea of using your pick at 19 or 31 on a guy like Bronny, who it comes with a lot of baggage, a lot of question marks, a lot of concern about what his actual NBA sort of ceiling is. It's hard to really parse like what is agent speak about how great Bronny is and what is just the reality of a guy who's six foot two and barely played this past season after a serious medical incident. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people agree Bronny would have been better served as going back to college. Um, and, and for like marketing purposes, I just don't think that's a thing the Raptors got to worry about. Like people are going to go watch the Raptors anyway. People are going to go to games and spend 200 bucks to sit in the upper bowl. That's not a problem. The Raptors don't have a marketing issue at all. Um, I, I just think it's a waste of a couple of pretty valuable picks in a range of the draft where you can find guys who can help this team going forward. And I think drafting Bronny James, like unless you're going and signing LeBron, which I don't think is happening. We'll get to that in the next question. But um, I, I just don't see the huge upside there. And it could be a serious lost opportunity to add to the core that you're trying to build here around Scotty Barnes and Emmanuel quickly going forward. That brings us to question number six from Old Baller asking, if the Raptors pick Bronny, do you expect Daddy LeBron will sign a reasonable contract to play with his son? No, I do not. Um, like LeBron is already on record recently, kind of falling back a little bit on his position about uh, wanting to play with Bronny and basically said, you know, if I can play against my son in a game, I will consider that dream fulfilled. Um, and so I, I just don't think you're convincing LeBron James in the twilight of his, of his career to come play in Toronto for a very young team that's probably not going to be ready to contend right away, even with LeBron James, although they'd certainly be a lot closer. Um, I, I just don't see that happening at all. Maybe there's a team out there where you take Bronny and you kind of, maybe like the Sixers, for example, think they have a real shot of luring LeBron James and forcing him to force his way to Philly. Um, I think if you think that's the case and you kind of have it through the grapevine that, ooh, this is what the Sixers want, maybe you go and take Bronny James before the Sixers can get him off the board, and then uh, you, you go and sort of you know, trade him to the Sixers for whatever ransom you can get or whatever. Um, I, I just don't see LeBron coming to Toronto as much as that would be uh, wonderful and hilarious all at the same time. Uh, it just doesn't seem super realistic, and it does not seem like he is like hell-bent on playing with his son like it maybe seemed a year or so ago. Another question here. This one comes from Loquacious Drew asking, why are Raps fans stupid enough to want to draft players that don't fit our team like Zach Eady? Um, look, I think this is harsh. I think this is, look, we're all stupid. It's the draft. We're all trying to prognosticate about 18-year-olds who have immense amounts of growth left to do as people uh, in their cerebellums. Like, it's just, it's really, really hard to do. And even the 22-year-olds like Zach Eady, really hard to project forward what it's all going to mean in the NBA. And so like everyone is stupid and no one is when it comes to the draft. It's totally fine to have your guys hit your wagons. Hell, I was like absolutely apoplectic when the Raptors took Jonas Valanciunas over Brandon Knight back in 2011. We all screw up. We all miss the boat on guys. We all uh, kind of underrate or overrate guys based on our own personal preferences and all of that. That's the beauty of basketball. That's the beauty of the draft. Everyone's different. Everyone is beautiful in the eye of some beholder. And I think that goes for Zach Eady as well. Like, I understand why a seven foot four, 300 pound guy with a lot of interior scoring touch and transcendent offensive rebounding numbers might be of interest, especially considering he has a Canadian passport, which is a thing Raptors fans have always valued going way back to when the Raptors were trying to go and lure Steve Nash by signing Landry Fields to a hilarious offer sheet or the Andrew Wiggins tankathon and all of that, right? The Canadian guys are valued by Canadian fans and that's fine. And I understand why people might want Zach Eady doesn't mean I agree with it. Doesn't mean I think it'd be a good fit for what the Raptors need. Doesn't mean I think he's bound for being an NBA starter long term or anything like that. But I don't think it's dumb to think that Zach Eady is a nice fit with the Raptors or someone the Raptors should go try to get. Um, I, I just disagree with it, and that's fine. And so, loquacious Drew, stop being so mean, would you? Next question, also from Drew. We will uh, get to this one quick. He asks, uh, why are, oh, sorry, uh, I almost read the, the mean question again. Who would be the worst case scenario? What would be the worst case scenario on draft night for the Raptors? And I do think the worst case scenario is pretty simple. It's the Raptors turning two picks into one. I do not want to see the Raptors trading up in this draft. I think that would be a pretty bad misuse of the two assets they have here at 19 and 31. Again, I think this is a great range of the draft to be in. 
I think at 31, we'll talk about day two of the draft and what it means coming up in just a second as well. Um, I, I think having pick 31 is a really nice, powerful position to be in going into day two of the draft. You get to field offers all night and all day before making that selection. You can prioritize, you know, do you have a guy you really want? Do you think you can get that guy later? Is there moving and shaking you can do? Can you get an extra first somehow? Can you turn 31 and Bruce Brown into a player? There's all sorts of possibilities here. And so I, I think, um, you know, using 19 and 31 to move up in the draft, would be a miserable idea. You want more shots in this draft, not fewer. And I, I think it, it would just be like the the smarter thing is to kind of trade back and get more picks. We can get into that a little bit too. But for the most part, I, I think the idea of trading up in this draft for one pick and consolidating 19 and 31 is just about the worst case scenario. And frankly, I don't think we're going to see that, thankfully. Um, I guess on this note, we'll get to one more question here before the break. This is from Bryden, number nine on the list is, do you think the Raptors end up using 19 as a trade piece for a more ready player? I do not. I, I don't think 19 is going to be traded. I think they're just going to use that pick. I think there's a lot of possibility in that range of the draft. And uh, you, you you have a chance of drafting someone who slips down. You get to prioritize someone maybe in that next tier of guys who you really, really covet and value. You know, if you want to take a swing on a guy like Pacom Dottie or something like that, you can do that at 19. Might not be the case if you're, you're waiting for 31 to be your first pick on the board. I do think flipping Bruce Brown plus 31 is interesting as to like what that could get the Raptors. Um, does it get them another pick in this draft? Does it get them a, a different fitting player than Bruce Brown who more complements what the Raptors need? Can it be your avenue to getting a backup point guard or a backup big man or something like that? I think that's a fascinating kind of thing to think about, especially with what day two of the draft is going to mean. And again, we got lots of day two, day two questions coming up in a sec here. Um, but no, I don't think 19 is going to be traded for a ready-made player. And frankly, if it is like, I don't know what kind of player you're getting for 19. I don't think as much as I like this range of the draft, I don't think teams value this draft super duper highly. So you're not going to get like a, a no brainer starter level player for pick number 19 or anything like that. Uh, and at and that point, I would rather just get the cost controlled guy who you have for the next four years who you can sort of add to your young core here and either have him be a future piece for a trade down the line or someone who can jump in and become part of your rotation as early as next season, the season after and be part of the young wave going forward here on a team that's very young. Um, so, you know, I don't think to trade 19 for a player 19 or sorry, 31 plus Bruce, maybe a different story. We'll come back on the other side and we will round it out with a few more draft related questions all about day two of the draft and the powerful position the Raptors find themselves in as the controllers of the board for day two. We'll talk to the bet. Talk about that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is sponsored by better help. And look, Sometimes you just got to have someone to talk to. It's a wonderful thing to have someone to kind of vent from your various stressors in life. You know, maybe you've gone through some major trauma. Maybe you've just got little things piling up as life tends to throw us a lot of little things that pile up. Having someone to talk to is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, we all carry those stresses around, but a therapist can help us kind of process those, make decisions in our life that can better us going forward, make us happier with whatever it is we're trying to improve or, or refine or, or get better with in our lives. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge, which is a huge deal. That is like, it's a hard thing to find someone who matches with you perfectly, and you can switch until you find someone without paying extra. That is fantastic. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right, rounding out our rapid fire draft mailbag edition of the show. Again, we got part two coming up with a whole bunch more draft related questions on Wednesday's show. Very much excited or looking forward to getting into all of those. But we have three questions here about day two of the draft, the second round where the Raptors sit there with pick number 31, courtesy of the Detroit Pistons. Uh, it's really funny the Pistons don't have this pick considering uh, they're the Pistons, but I digress. This one comes from Zakeem 10 in the Discord asking, uh, for or against the two-day draft? Uh, I like this question a lot. Super for the two-day draft. There's nothing I hate more than burnout on draft night where, you, you know, the first round ends, all the excitement is over, and then it's just like, oh, okay, uh, 
we got to sit through another two hours of this while we kind of just names just sort of breathlessly swipe by on the ticker. You can't keep up with what's going on. There's a million minor trades for 36 and 38 for 42 and 59 or whatever. Um, that'd be a weird trade, but I, you know, you get what I mean. Like it just, you can't keep up with it. It's nice to make it a two day event. And I do think it's probably going to lead to a lot more trade action, which us little piggies love so, so much. Of course, um, I, I think just having that lead time between the first day and the second day is going to give teams a chance to regroup, a chance to kind of reevaluate their boards and take a second to think, oh, OK, I want this guy. How can we get this guy? Is there someone we can trade with? Maybe it means more players are on the move, frankly. Like, I do think the possibilities are pretty endless with what this could mean. And I'm really excited to see what the first year of doing this two day draft, since I guess they did it back in like the eighties or whatever, um, really means it's, uh, it's really exciting. I'm looking forward very much to the Raptors being the grand poobahs of the board on day two. And, uh, uh yeah, totally in favor. I don't want to be staying up till midnight waiting for second round picks to come in. No one wants that, man. It's, it's the worst. I remember doing that on the East coast a couple of years ago. I was out in Nova Scotia, for the Scotty Barnes draft and the second round was going on and I'm waiting and waiting for Delano Banton and David Johnson's names to get called in the second round until like 1231 local time. And I just, no, we don't need that man. Four o'clock for round two, get it done by six o'clock. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Well done. NBA. You've planned this beautifully. Next question here. It's not really a question, but it comes from a pal cause in the discord. Maybe not a question, so he's acknowledged this off the top. That's good. But I find not enough people are discussing the impact of having the first pick in the second round. Not this guy, but talking about it for weeks, baby. Uh, the following day and the leverage it provides the Raptors front office by being able to field potential offers all night and the following day or having extra time to make their selection if they have a guy they really like there at 31. I find this to be such an interesting little subplot to the draft. Um, yeah, a wordy question from Cause. Wasn't a question from Cause, but we'll give Cause a break. He does a lot of work managing the Locked On Raptors uh, Fantasy League, so we can give him a break for being wordy with this. But uh, yeah, I, I think this is a massive factor. We talked about it a couple weeks ago with Maxwell Bombach from No Ceilings just the impact this could have. And again, we don't really know just yet what it's all going to mean to pick at 31, but there's no way this can be a bad thing for the Toronto Raptors. And it's just nice to kind of be in that pole position. You can sort of hold court over the course of the 12 hours leading up. And maybe the Raptors do the Raptors thing where they take a lot of offers and say, not, nah, not for us. But if there's a bidding war for 31, if there's three, four, five teams out there who say, oh man, we got to get ourselves that 30, 31st pick so we can get our guy. Uh, I, I think that's uh, like a, a really fascinating thing to kind of consider. I think, um, you know, that there, there's just, again, we don't know exactly what the possibilities are going to be. It could just be that they trade 31 back a, a couple of spots and it's nothing, no, no crazy, you know, ridiculous kind of, you know, ground shaking move or anything like that. But um, there's the pure opportunity of being able to take on those offers and, and take some time to consider them is a valuable thing. Uh, that you just would not have had the time or the luxury to do under the previous draft structure where it's okay. End of round one draft round two starts. Now go to draft guys. You have two minutes on the clock. Go nuts. Like how do you get anything done in that span? I don't, I don't understand how front offices pulled off any trades, frankly, in the second round before moving it to a second day. Um, and look, you know, the Raptors got lucky here. They, they got the pick from the Knicks that the Pistons had traded them in the OG trade. Maybe they targeted that for this very specific reason, although I think this was well before day two of the draft was even announced. So I'm not going to give them credit on the foresight for that. Uh, but obviously having the Pistons pick never a bad thing in the second round. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really curious to see. Maybe this ends up being like a massive boon. Maybe the Raptors get like a serious surplus value in a trade just because of their positioning here. We don't know yet. If they don't, I don't think it's some great shame or, or failure either. Um, but it's just nice to have the opportunity. It's nice to be wanted. And I think that pick is going to be wanted by a lot of teams. Number 12, rounding it out. There are question today from Wall 709 in the Discord. I know you've been talking about the value of having the first pick on day two. But would you trade 31 to Indiana for 36 and either 49 or 50 or to Memphis for 39 and 57? Essentially, do you think setting the board is on day two is more valuable than another shot at the dartboard. I don't think I would look, there's a possibility that 
you know, you get to the the day of the draft and this is the move and, and you say, oh, yeah, we'll get an extra second round pick here. And that's all you do and move down a little bit. I don't really think I care about picks after 40 in the second round, kind of as a general rule. Um, you know, if you're not familiar, I think a lot of sort of agenting and politicking comes into the draft after about the 40th pick where, you know, eventually it becomes almost more lucrative for guys to negotiate two way deals or undrafted for agent contracts. And they can kind of guide themselves to teams where they think they're going to have opportunities. And frankly, you'll hear you know, plenty of stories about guys who just tell teams, do not draft me. I don't want to play for you. And I, you know, I have another opportunity somewhere else. And that is just kind of how the back end of the draft goes. We saw it with, you know, having Delano Banton and David Johnson, right? Like it's really tough to hit on a pick after 40. I think you want to be in that high thirties range, especially in this draft. I do think it's kind of, you know, 35 forties where things start to slip off into more sort of clear second round territory. So you can get first round talents in the, that sort of top 10 part of that second round. And so that's, these are not trades I would really consider if I'm the Raptors. I don't care about the 57th pick in the draft. Go look at the history of 57th picks. Doesn't yield you very much typically. Same for 49 and 50, really. Like that is the part of the draft where it's all based on agents and two way negotiations and things like that. Um, and so I don't really care about picking up extra picks there. You know, an extra pick in the 30s wouldn't be the worst thing. Um, but I, I don't think you're getting two picks in the 30s, for example, uh, in exchange for 31. I don't even think there's two teams that have those picks in the 30s that you can go and potentially trade for. Um, you know, that there's just it, it, it's tricky. I guess you have the Blazers have 34 and 40. Maybe if the Blazers really want someone at 31, you could trade back to 34 and 40. That's not the worst idea in the world. But beyond that, I don't quite see that being the move. I do think there is some validity to the idea of kind of using both of your picks to trade back and getting extra picks, though. Um, Sam Bassini did an exercise on his Game Theory podcast this week, actually, uh, or very recently, where him and Bryce Simon went through and traded every first round pick, uh, an, an exercise of, okay, if they traded this pick, what would it be for? And one of the suggestions that Sam came up with in this episode was the idea of the Raptors trading 19 and 31 to the Knicks for 24, 25, and 38 which I think is kind of intriguing. 38 may be right on the borderline of where you want to be, but having 24 and 25 in this range of the draft um, might be worth it. You know, you kind of get two picks back to back. You can take your guys there, same tier or your know, class of guys that you're probably looking at at 19 anyway. Obviously, fewer guys available, and maybe you don't want to trade back if you really value someone at 19 who you're scared is going to drop or not going to drop all the way to 24, 25. It's a big calculation to make. It's probably something that happens on draft night and you kind of see how the board's going. But I don't think that's a terrible idea by any means. Um, I, I just think overall, when it comes to that 31st pick, yeah, controlling the board is more valuable than the 49th or 50th or 57th pick, I guess, to answer the question in a short way. Um, that is the way you want to go. And I, I think, you know, whatever decision they make, they should make that decision at 355 on the second day of the draft, five minutes before that pick 31 is on the clock field offers as long as you can don't go and trade away that pick before that, that, that opportunity to run the board presents itself um, just because you want to pick up an extra couple picks in a part of the second round that usually doesn't really yield a whole lot. So um, yeah, that's uh, my answer to that. We have a whole bunch more mailbag questions. We're going to get to tomorrow related to the draft. You guys really came through. Appreciate it very much. If you want to have uh, your questions answered on the show, of course, the Discord is the place to go. Uh, come hang out. Link in the description of the podcast. It's free to join. would love to see you become part of our listener family over on the Discord. Uh, as always, you can find me on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find uh, the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. You can follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. All that good stuff on the audio apps. And, of course, the YouTube channel is there for your subscribing to as well at your leisure. Go check out Locked On Sports today, 24-7 as well. Our all-day streaming channel covering all the biggest stories in sports with our local experts. A wonderful place to go and stay in the loop on the NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals, baseball season, etc., etc. And with that, we will leave you there. We'll talk to you again tomorrow with part two of our massive jumbo rapid-fire draft mailbag. Until then, have a great one. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Wow, I can't hit anything. I've lost the line.